All right, so welcome to this class. We're going to be looking at network services uh, facilitated by Sandy Samuel uh, from the Department of Applied Computing and IT at Macquarie University Business School, Faculty of Computing and Informatics. So we want to look at network services and understand what uh, some of those services and why are they important to us as network engineers. So this is the learning objective uh, upon completion of this class. You, we, you would have got an understanding and knowledge of some of the common most network services available on the network. So what are network services? We know that computer networks are set up for users, users like you, like me, and these users access certain services provided by the network. For example, you wanted to go to MOPSAP and join a Zoom class. You are actually accessing a service on the network. And that is maybe the hypertext transfer protocol service, which is going to render the web pages to you. And you're accessing a web server, which is storing MOBSEP and it's going to return the files to you. Or you want to go to MOBSEP and download your results. I think very soon results will be uploaded there or maybe shared on WhatsApp, depending on what we agree upon. So that means that you are accessing some of the services that are provided by the network. So network administrators, now you guys configure and set up these services on routers, switches, servers, and ETC, so that users can be able to access the services depending on what they need to achieve. So these services run on certain ports, as you will see that TCP runs on port 21, HTTP runs on port 80. You understand the idea of ports as you go on and you, as you start your practical sessions. But you should note that not all users are people, actually. Sometimes there may be any devices that require a given service from another network component. And this can also be a user on a network. So it could be a switch, it could be a router, it could be a firewall, it could be any device, or it could be actually you personally, or it could be a Wi-Fi access point. So some of the examples of common services include, but not limited to DHCP, we're going to look at it, uh, NAT, we're going to look at it, DNS, web server, mail server, file server, uh, print server, and so on and so on. So these are some of the services that you as network engineers, sorry, as users need all, uh, to access some of the, uh, the resources available on the network, right? Uh, so moving forward, we are going to first look at the network service called the network address translation, right? We have just looked at IP addresses and we noted that uh, an IP address has a particular range. For example, for us, if we have not subnetted class C, we can only get a tune of 65,000 addresses available. So, but we know there are billions of devices connected to the internet today. And all of those devices need a unique IP address for them to be on the internet. So we want to understand how then was it made possible? Because over those billion devices, and we have a few addresses available, how is it even possible? And how was it made possible? So it was made possible by what we call network address translation. We are saying that network address translation, it is going to translate our IP address carried in the header of an IPv4 packet into another IP address. We are getting our traditional IP address, the IP version 4 address, right? And we are going to go ahead and translate it into another IP address. Generally, what we are saying is that NAT is used to translate private addresses into public addresses so that devices can communicate across private and public networks. So, to solve the problem of public IP version 4 address shortage uh, caused by the internet expansion, because as you know, around 2000, where the internet busted and so, so many people are getting onto the internet, so many services over the internet, IP addresses, the public addresses were depleted and they were not enough for all the devices. That's why the network engineers like you and me sat down then and decided to come up with a service called network address translation to come and solve uh, this problem 
and come up as a temporary uh, solution. So what is the background of uh, network uh, address translation, all right? Are we on the same page, guys? Have I lost you or you have lost me? We are there. We are the same page. So in the early 1990s, right? Uh, relevant requests for documents began raising the possibility of us exhausting all the IP version 4 addresses. In fact, they were becoming depleted. And more and more IP addresses are requested every day. We are connecting devices and uh, rapid growth because TCP IP based addresses or application purely depend on IP addresses. And this became a major challenge. So to address this particular challenge of having limited addresses, IP version six was developed then, right? As a success of IP version four. But in contrast to IP version four, which is defined as a 32 bit value, IP version six has a size of 128 bits, meaning we have more addresses available, uh, more than what we need for now. And for network applications, IP version six has significantly larger address space compared to IP version four. However, today, right? IP version six has a long way to go before it can completely replace IP version four, because due to the immature technologies and huge update costs associated with IP version six. And today, most of our internet and network infrastructure is purely built on IP version four. That's why it's going to take some time. It's going to be hard for IP version six to just come in directly and replace IP version uh, four. So because IP version six will not completely replace IP version four or immediately, engineers like you had to come up with workarounds that are required to extend the use of the available IP addresses we have, right? For example, techniques like uh, the CIDR, the classless interdomain routing, which we just looked at, the variable length mask, uh, masking and then the network address, which can be used to address that issue. So private addresses are used to implement address reuse and increase utilization of IP resources within an organization. And that's why we had those categories of private class, which one, A, B, and C, with those ranges. Now those ones can be privately used by any organization, even by you or me within my home or organization. But remember, private addresses are used on private networks, whereas public addresses are used on public networks, for example, the internet. So if you ever want to access the internet, Airtel or MTN, which is your ISP, has to be in position to, uh, to, uh, to assign to you a public IP address. Your private IP address cannot be used to access the public, uh, public network. So NAT then must be used to translate our private addresses. The private addresses we have at MOBS, we need to have NAT, which is going to translate those private addresses into a public address, which can now allow us to access the internet. And therefore, that means that each organization can reuse these private net addresses. I can have an IP address as 192.168.0.1. And you also in your organization or your home, as long as it's the same network with mine, you can also have the same. But once both of us want to access the internet, then some kind of NAT will be performed. Some kind of network address translation will be performed for us to be able to access the internet. Are we together, guys? So we are saying IP uh, version me, sir. cannot completely replace IP version 4 immediately. And for us excuse to me, mitigate this exhaustion, we came up with a technology of NAT, for example, to continue the image. Yes, you're excused. Thank you. Um... I think I'm kind of mixing this stuff uh, somehow, somewhere. Like, 
we have an ISP, our internet service provider, who will provide us with a public IP address. But uh, our, our network is private, for example, moves. That means we will have a private ISP. So does it mean uh, this ISP, I mean, this, uh, this IP must be translated by our internet service provider for us to access the, the internet, then does it remain now private since it has been translated into public? Thank you, Godwin, for that. You have actually asked and almost answered yourself, right? When you have your local network, you're going to have your private. When you have your MiFi, right? It's going to give you an IP address of like 192.168.0.20.5.100, right? That is private now. But as you, as you are accessing the internet, your ISP is also going to assign you for example, it could be one or two or three. We can, we can see that different network, ad, network address translation techniques, right? Either by address pool, we shall look at it shortly, right? But they will translate it now, right? Depending on your source IP and your port number, and they will translate it to that and then it will be able to access the internet. So you may find like an entire organization like MOBS is using one public IP, address right or they are using two let's say but let's give an example of one but if all those computers now need to connect to the internet they are private addresses the ones that adb right are going to be translated into that one public address which is now going to be translated and it will be a public address but it is translated the beauty of that it is that it's going to hide your ip address intentionally right and then this helps you hackers will not be able to trace what um the source of that computer or where it's coming from because the address they will be dealing with is already translated we're going to look at some of the benefits of network address translation later on but the concept is translate our ip version for address into another ip address that is a concept right so Moving forward, we are saying that internal networks assigned private addresses. We know like at MOBS at your home, your Wi-Fi device is going to assign you a private address. And these addresses are not routable on the internet. You can use them to share files locally among yourself, but the moment you want to access MOBS or any platform, which is on the internet, then you cannot use your private address to access that internet so public addresses on the other hand are routable on the internet and as such allow internal hosts to connect to the outside world like the internet and public addresses are not free to use as private addresses so meaning for you to get hold of a public address you need to acquire it you need to buy it from an isp or what we call an internet service provider or if you're government then you are they are assigned to you by an organization called i can so internet service providers offer public addresses to their customers at a fee all right so moves will go ahead since they're not free they cannot buy for everyone imagine if they buy for buambare they buy for sandy they buy for jovia they buy for brenda they buy for rita imagine how much money Mobs would spend just to make sure that all the students go ahead and access the internet. But an organization will just go ahead and acquire like one or two, depending on what you want to achieve. And then we'll use that one to translate it so that it, uh, private addresses can access the internet. And that's why we are saying, because they're even not enough, even if we had the money and we wanted to buy for everyone, they would definitely not allow because they're not enough for everyone to have like a, a, a thousand or um, two thousand public addresses for use internally, all right? So it would not be feasible. So network address translation, all right? We are saying that there are billions of devices around the globe which require IP addresses. Your smartwatches, fridges, TVs these days, my TV, my fridge, like literally everything 
has a way it can connect to the internet. And this is what we call the internet of things, which has made it even bigger. So NAT has helped in addressing the issue of the IP version 4 exhaustion. And NAT allows hundreds or thousands of devices with private IP addresses to use a single or few public addresses to connect to the internet. We are saying that without NAT, it would mean that a company will have to buy public addresses for every host they have on their network, which is not feasible. And even if it wanted to, imagine all the companies in the world, if they all decided to buy public addresses for every host, they will not be available today. They would have been exhausted because we know it is only 32 bits in length. So if you do n to power 32, those are the number of available addresses we can get per particular IP network, all right? So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of NAT or network address translation? We are saying, with NAT, IP addresses can be reused. I can use it in my organization at MOOC. You can use it at MOOC. You can use it in URA or any other organization. Even at your home, you can use the same IP address. And the network address translation process is transparent to users, all right? And privacy protection is available to internal users. Why privacy protection is available is because even if hackers want to understand the root or the source of that IP address, they cannot be able to attack because they do not know, they do not know that this IP address is actually this because it has been translated. Whatever they will see on the public network will be translated into that particular network. Now, for those of you who go ahead and want to um, and, 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 and give into hacking, you understand that an IP address is one of the basic things you will need or require for you to attack a given network, all right? So there's also load balancing among its internal servers. It is available as a result of net, network address translation. You are able to balance the load across the different servers in your network. The disadvantage is that sometimes network monitoring becomes more difficult. For example, if a hacker somewhere on the internet does something and you want to know where exactly the threat is originating from, or government of Uganda is, is, wants to know how they can be able to track back whoever has hacked into a given bank. It is difficult because this address they are dealing with has already been translated. And of course, some applications are also restricted. They do not work or require you to have a network ad to translated address, okay? So, so in addition to just reuse, NAT continues to evolve and provide other advantages, okay? And we have looked at advantages like numerous hosts on our local area network can use a few public addresses to access external resources, the internet, the TCP, FTP, Telnet, and ETC and ETC, right? We also know that internal and external network users are unaware of the IP address translation process. It is transparent to them. For you, you don't have to mind that, oh, it is now time for me to access WhatsApp. Let me first go ahead and translate my local IP, my private IP into a public IP. For you, you are unaware of that process, but it so happens transparently, and that way you are using the network efficiently and effectively. This so privacy protection is provided for our internal users. External users or network users cannot directly obtain the IP address and service information of where the source of that IP which has been translated is coming from. And we can also have multiple servers here with load shading, multiple servers which are configured for load balancing. That helps us to reduce pressure on each server in case there's heavy traffic, BBA is doing exams, uh, BBC is doing exams the same day and there's a lot of traffic, we can do what we call load balancing. So the disadvantages are, like I told you already, NAT cannot be performed if the packet header is encrypted. For example, an encrypted FTP connection. The port command cannot translate an IP address. And also it makes supervision more difficult, like tracing the hacker who has attacked a particular a server on the public network. 
from a private network is difficult because this IP address of the hacker has been uh, translated. Now, briefly, the basic principle, right? We said now, Bambali, we are coming to your question, that NAT translates the source and destination IP address in a packet header so that numerous private addresses can access the private network through a limited number of public addresses, right? So generally, every NAT device maintains an address translation table. We have what we call a net address translation table. And the IP addresses of these packets that pass can someone who is Sierra 7? Guys, I'm taking attendance and you are making noise and you're Sierra 7. I'm afraid your records will not be returned. I strongly advise that you use your name, Sierra 7, and you meet your microphone. Thank you. All right, shall we continue? Yes, please. All right, so we are saying that NAT mechanism uh, for the following uh, there is there is a question which there's question? a question yes. in the chat I, uh someone was asking what uh, that you explained the meaning of encryption all right that is from uh, at kwasa charlotte charlotte encryption basically means hiding information or turning that information into unreadable format for the unauthorized recipients like if I want to send a message to you and I don't want Bambari to read it, I am going to encrypt it and decode it, maybe use ABCD or use scrambled mechanism and send you the message. And then after with that message, I send you the key of how you can decrypt that message so that you can read it and understand it. Basically encryption is the ability or it's a process of hiding uh, information and make it unreadable to the an uh, 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 unintended recipients. I hope I've answered you, Charlotte. All right, uh, Birunji Innocent was asking, uh, please roughly estimate the cost of IP addresses for any ISP in Uganda. Uh, sometimes they will not tell you that this is the cost of this particular address, but the, on the package which they will give you, for example, if you bought internet, from uh, either MTN or Rogue, and uh, you want to subscribe monthly, right? On the package which they're going to give you, for example, I use Liquid Telecom here where I am, and I pay 189 every month for my unlimited bandwidth, right? Unlimited uplink and downlink. So, but part of that package comes together with an IP, public IP address, which is going to enable me to access that internet so i can take that cost to be part because ideally i need that ip address and ideally i'm actually paying for that ip address for me to be able to access the internet so depending for example zuku uh, where I, I i was before we are using zuku and zuku was about 150 per month and they give you one address and in case you want to have more than one public address you would go ahead and double the amount of money so it purely depends on the isp all right the internet service provider so we shall continue and i was saying uh, let me just keep the chat open so that i don't miss uh, some of your questions so i was literally saying that um not mechanism involves the following process. One, we have our NAT table, all right? And the process is that translate the IP addresses and port numbers of internal hosts. We have our internal hosts and they're sending. As they're sending, they are, they, are, they are using some port numbers for them to be able to send. And then it's going to, in, they're going to translate them into the external addresses and port numbers of the NAT device. And then the external addresses and port numbers into the addresses and port numbers of internal hosts and vice versa. So that is not implement translation between the private address plus port number and public address plus port number. And the NAT devices are located between the internal and external 
networks. So packets exchanged between internal hosts and external servers all pass through our NAT device. For example, this is our NAT device, or our firewall is doing our network address translation, right? But some of the common devices are routers, right? You don't have to go and specifically buy a specific um, NAT device. Most of the routers we have have NAT capabilities. Even our firewalls as well do network address translation. So as we can see here, we have our destination IP address, right? Which is 123.3.2.3. And our source IP address, where this original thing is coming from, it is coming, let's say, from this computer and it's going to be sent to this computer. Now, internally, our computer has these devices, right? It has 10.1.1.1, right? That is our private. We are in, which class is this? This is class A, right? Private class A. And our computer wants to access files from our FTP server, maybe to download a course outline. And our FTP server here has 192, let me see if I can get a highlighter, has 192 uh, dot, dot what? Let me just get a highlighter here very briefly. Has 192, all right? This is our, this is our source IP address for our server here, right? And this is our source computer, which wants to go ahead and access that computer. So our source IP is that and our destination IP. Ideally, what we are saying, trying to say, this computer wants to go ahead and access a particular file on the internet from our FTP server, which is where, which is there. But in between here, we have our firewall, or it could be even what? It could be a router, right? And it's going to help us do the network address translation. We said when you're doing the address translation, it goes ahead and adds on the port number, right? The port number of our IP address, and then it will go ahead and translate it, right? So what happens here is that it's going to translate our source address into a public address. And the NAT device is going to assign it a public address. And here, after when the packet is coming back, it's going to translate the destination address into a private address as the information is going back. So therefore, these computers are able to access the internet using one public address, which was assigned to these computers. Ideally, that is how network address translation works, all right? So what are some of the categories or the techniques we use when we are doing network address translation? We have what we call the address pool, the outbound interface address, or what we call easy IP, and the static uh, mapping NAT server, right? So NAT is divided into three categories based on application scenario, or what you want to achieve as a network engineer. And we are saying that the source NAT, basically here, enables multiple private network users to access the internet at the same time, right? It is going to enable you and me, other computers access uh, on the NDB to access the internet at the same Excuse time. Excuse me, sir. Yes, please. Excuse me, sir. Good yes. morning. Good morning. I didn't understand the, the previous, that previous thing you understand. You were, you were, you were what? You were explaining. I was understanding. When okay. you're explaining that one. What here didn't you understand so that we Sorry. help you understand? Uh, Everything, the firewall, I tell the router, I was hearing, just hearing, but I did understand. You are hearing, but you did not what? Understand. This is who? This is Jovia. Yes. Jovia, please pay attention, right? We are saying okay. that network address translation, too bad I don't have my paint, right? Network address translation just helps us to translate our source IP address, right? To translate our source IP address into a public IP address that you are familiar with, right? Are we together? Yes, yes. And this computer A here wants to go ahead, right? This computer A here wants to go ahead and send or receive a packet from our file FTP server, right? FTP server is a file, file transfer protocol server 
the one which is responsible for sharing files on our network. Are you together? So let's say you are seated on this computer A and you just want maybe to download a file or even to upload a file. I've asked you to upload a particular assignment or now I'm observe FTP server. Are you together? And our FTP server has its destination address as 12.3.2.3. Dot three, right? This is our destination IP address. That's why it's even here in our table because we know initially in the previous classes for any communication to take place, the computer must know one, the source address and the destination IP address. If it doesn't know, then it will go through a protocol called the ARP or what we call the address resolution protocol for it to find out what is the destination, who exactly am I supposed to send to or who am I supposed to communicate to? Are we together? All right? We're yes. on the same page? Yes, uh -huh. sir. Then here, our NAT device, which could be a firewall or a router, right? It has this IP address. Are you together? Of 123.3.2.1. And we are saying this address attached to it is our public address. Are we on the same page now? Uh-huh. So A goes and initiates a network and wants to send a packet. But remember this address here cannot access our public network, right? We need to translate it into this one so it can be able to access the internet. Are we on the same page? Yes, sir. We're the same page, all right? So as no, we, we are not. What, what, what do you mean you're not on the same page? What is disturbing you, please? Tell me, I want us to be on the same page because I have not explained anything. I'm just showing you what is on the screen. Tell me why, why you're not on the same page. I go back. I don't know what is on the screen. <laughs> we don't know what is on the screen. Have you been on or you have been watching a movie somewhere? Okay, of all the things I've talked about, what do you remember, please? I just want to know where I can pick you from. Because I've been on this slide for over five minutes. Okay, but do you know what network address translation is all about? Please respond so that we move very fast. You are taking your colleagues behind, so respond. We'll see where we can pick you from and we'll be on the same page. Do you know what network transla address translation is all about? Yeah, I know that. You know what network address translation is all about? Yeah. We are trying to translate our private addresses into our public address, right? Yeah. That one you know. And this is what yeah, the screen that. is trying to demonstrate. And I'll repeat one more last time. And for everyone who is going to come, please pay attention, right? We are saying, this is just an illustration. We have two computers here. We have computer A and we have computer B, right? Computer B is somewhere else, let's say in the cloud, right? All on a different, premises. Computer A is you at ADB lab seated wanting to download a file from our file server. Are we together? Are we together there? Yeah, we are together. Uh-huh. So, but for, we know that we have assigned a private address to computer A. And we know that a private address cannot access what? The internet. Are we together? And for us to be able to access our server at MoveZip, we know we need to first access what? The internet. Are we together? And that's where this device mm. is seen. The network address device comes in to translate our, our address into a, a public address. So this computer here, has its IP address of 10.1.1.1. .1 .1. This one, source IP address. 
and it knows it wants to go ahead and communicate and send a file or download a file to our file server which is at this ip address destination ip address of 123.3.2.3 which is the same here on this table right this computer here has an address of 123.3.2.3 right and this computer wants to establish a communication from computer a to the file server to either download or upload a file are we together yeah we're together all right so as this one is accessing the internet this private address is going to be translated into this public address are we together this public address here is assigned to our nat device are we together so it's going to be translated and we are telling it that hey look we want to access the internet and go ahead and download a file so please translate our ip address into that and then go ahead and access our server which is at what 123.3.2.3 this one here isn't it so as this computer is receiving communication from the computer a as you can see now that that this that that the, the address it is going to send to or the address it is receiving from it is not 10.1.1.1 .1 .1 .1. are we together Ideally, under normal circumstances, if the net, same network, the destination address for this one would be the address of this computer, right? But as you can see, the destination address, this computer knows that when I'm going to communicate back to send back the file, I am sending to the public address, this one here, all right? Which is 123.3.2.1. Ideally, this private address has been translated to 123.3.2.1. We are together. So that's why we are saying that one, it's going to translate our destination or our private source address into a public address. This one, it has been translated into a public address. And now similarly here, as this guy is also sending back, it is going to just send back to this guy once the network address translation device or the, our router receives our packet, it's now going to go ahead and translate back this public IP address into our local address. That's why now the destination from here is what? 10.1.1. It knows that as I'm sending back, I translated this address, so I should go ahead and send back my packet to that computer. So we have our source, it is coming from our server, and then the destination, the computer knows that I am sending back to our local host, which is A. Are we on the same page now? Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Yes, Peter, your hand is up. Yes, Master, I would like to know what if we are having two computers that, you want, that are communicating using the same router, what would happen? Will they use the same public address or, or what? Remember, we said initially, all right? No, that no, as, we, guy, as we are addressed- to pick Ms. Vistat. Glenn, Glenn, your- ah, your yeah, those are some shit. <laughs> Okay. Remember we're saying, as we are addressing, we address to, we, 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 we translate two things, right? We address together with the port. Are we together? So if there are two computers, this one would be maybe on port 8001. And remember, some of these ports are randomly assigned. And then the other computer will also be what? Let's say 8002. Are we together? The IP address of that computer and that port of 8002. So as they are sending back, it also will translate back to this port. So remember this. I, it is a different IP address and also a different port, right? And then this one also has a different port. Are we together? So that way, it will be the same public IP address when translated, but the port will be what? Different. Are we together?
Okay. I hope we are together. So I'm saying it has these two, these are three techniques or categories. With the address pool mode where I was, the public address in the address pool I used to translate users private address. And this mode applies when you have many private network users access the internet, then you use an address pool. You get all um, uh, your private and assign them to a particular pool of a public IP addresses. Then we have outbound interface address. And this one basically, or what we call is a EP, uh, the IP address of internal hosts are translated into the public address of an outbound interface on a public network. Okay, and this mode applies when the public address is dynamically allocated. Like for example, uh, here at uh, uh, most of the MTN or Liquid Telecom or Zuko, sometimes they dynamically allocate you a public address. And now what you do on your gateway or on your router, you use outbound interface that whatever is coming and is going to the internet will be translated to whatever address is signed to that interface. Because sometimes it's dynamic. You don't know, you cannot assign because you don't know it already, All right? So we know what the interface is. On your interface, on your outgoing interface, the connection which connects to you, right? It's what we call the interface. And then we have server mapping, which enables external users to access servers on the private, network, right? You have external users, it's going to enable them to be able to access your servers on the private network. So those are the three categories. What time is it? We so far use the one hour and a half almost. So we have a quick question here. Which of the following are areas or which of the following are reasons why not emerged? Anyone to give it a try? You tell me your answer and why you think it's correct. Which of the following are reasons why not emerged? We have A, insufficient IP address resources. We have B, protection to real IP address of internal servers. We have C, requirements of specific services. We have D, demand for easy device management. This is a multi-choice question. Uh, you choose more than one option. Anyone? I think I think the answer is B and D. You think the answer is B and B and D. B and D, you D. think the answer is B and D. So Viola is saying for her, she thinks the answer is B and D. Okay, anyone else? Thank you, Viola. Someone says uh, they think it is A and B. Someone says B and B. I don't know what B and B means, but uh, Marvin, what, what were you trying to mean? Yeah, I think it's A and B. Someone says it's A and B. A and B. <laughs> All right, so the answer here, because we talked about these things already, right? And the answer here would be, would be what? Would be A and B, all right? Because we said one, we don't have enough IP addresses, right? That's why we are coming up with such technologies. And then two, to protect the real IP address from internal, of internal servers. Let's say you have your server and you don't want hackers to know the IP address of that server because if they know, then they can directly attack it. Are we together? So that gives us our answer. And I think a question like that will come. So please pay attention. So dynamic host configuration protocol, what we call the DHCP, right? And if addresses can be assigned mainly in two ways, because we, I've been talking computers having this address, computer A having address of 192.1. How do they get those addresses? How do we assign them those addresses? How did you assign your computer an address? And we are saying we have two ways of how we can assign addresses to computers, right? The first way 
is to st statically assign an IP address to a computer, all right? It is to assign what? To assign statistica statically or dynamically. So we can statically assign a, an address to a computer or dynamically. By statically means we are going to go ahead, go to your computer, go to the configuration, go assign an IP address, and it's not going to change. Dynamically is by allowing the DHCP server to go ahead and dynamically assign IP addresses to the different comp uh, hosts available. Static assignment requires the admin or user or network engineer like you to manually go to your IP address uh, uh, configuration and type in the addresses to the hosts, e.g. the network address, the network, uh, the network, sorry, the IP address, the network address, a subnet mask, default gateway, and DNS, the domain name system. We shall look at it also briefly. So as network devices increase, imagine if all the computers that moved, someone has to manually go there and put in the IP address. It would be very difficult. And you even get issues later on because you do not forget, you forget which address was assigned to what computer in lab three, which address was assigned to what computer in lab four. So it would be uh, a lot of work. So the amount of time spent on configuring address information is enormous and the process is tedious and monotonous. Just imagine having to configure all those computers we have talked about, maybe even hundreds or thousands of those computers. It would be extremely hard. So the process is maybe let me just come here and get my network settings very fast. Um, let me just come here to control panel. I don't know if this update still has control panel. Okay, so the control panel and I'm going to go to network and internet and I want to go to uh, it was the uh, view network statuses uh, connect to a network. Let me go to view network status. And then I have my network and then I'm going to go to uh, double click to my Wi-Fi settings here. And then I'm going to come to what? To properties. And then just imagine I'm going to properties and then I'm going to go to IP version what? Version four. And then on IP version four, I'm going to go ahead and say, I want to manually, because as you can see, I'm obtaining an IP address, which is automatically assigned to me by my what? By my router. If I come here very fast and I open my uh, command prompt, okay? If I open my command prompt here very fast, and then I go and say IP config, you'll be able to see that I am using my wireless LAN adapter. And this is the IP address, which is assigned to what? To my computer of 192.168.0.103. I did not assign this IP address by myself or even the default gateway. I did not assign the IP address myself, right? It is the DHCP server on my router or the DHCP protocol, which assigned me this IP address. And if I had multiple, my, I, I assume my phone has a different IP address. I assume my other computer has a different IP address and my TV as well. So what I'm trying to say here, if I wanted to manually configure it, I would come here and put in a, an address, 192, and then go ahead and put in 168, and then go ahead and put in dot zero, and then go ahead and put in dot what? Dot, let's say 102. And then I would go ahead and put the default. This is a subnet mask. You know why it's like this? Why do you think this is a default subnet mask? Of 255. Because it is, because it is class C. Because it is what? Class C. And then I would go ahead and put in the default gateway. And we said usually the default gateway is the what? The network address. All right? Or maybe an address which is reserved for the network. So that would be my uh, default gateway. And then I go ahead, it is dot one. And then I go ahead and prefer DNS. I would use the one for Google dot eight, which would be 
dot eight dot eight dot eight dot eight or dot four dot four dot four. This is the DNS for Google. So I'd go ahead and put in all those things. But imagine this amount of work. If I had to do this for all the computers, and remember, I'm assigning a valid IP address and the one which has not been assigned to any other computer. So meaning I have a list somewhere, and after signing, I tick. You see how tedious, tedious it becomes for me to, uh, to assign an IP address manually. I went the same page, guys, right? So it would be tedious. But sometimes it is important, let's say on a printer, you want a printer to have a static IP address. You don't want it to change. Whenever you want to print, you know that you're sending that work or that load to that particular printer. You don't want the printer to change, right? So in some circumstances, like even for the router, the IP address of the router, you don't want it to change. So you assign it manually or you give it a static IP address for the printer, like servers, like a server, you don't want it to have a dynamic IP address. You are saying IP address. So there are instances where it is important for you as a network engineer to assign a static IP or to use dynamically assigned IP addresses. So besides every user who wants to connect to the network for the very first time will acquire to patch in the addresses details. So DHCP comes in to our rescue. With the DHCP, what we call the dynamic host configuration protocol, um, the network admin just centrally configures all the available address information on their server or the router. And then the router will use such details to automatically go ahead and send those or assign different IP addresses to all those hosts available on the network. Maybe if I'm to open here very briefly, my, I think it was 192.0.1, right? Okay. So I have uh, just logged into my TP link. Uh, it is my router at home here. And as you can see, there's DHCP here, which we are talking about, all right? In the setting here, you can see it is what? Enabled. Can you see my screen, guys? Yes, sir. It is enabled. And we are telling no. that as you're assigning the IP address, start from what? From 192.168.0. what? 100 right and then go ahead and end at what meaning all the devices which will be connected to my network will automatically get an ip address okay and then we have what we call this time we shall look into it but this is the time if a device becomes vacant then it was it will look for about uh, uh these minutes and then it will reassign that ip address to another device and the dnss are option as well. So you go ahead and configure the default gateway and every machine will be assigned either dot one hundred dot one. So as you can see, my main laptop is having dot one hundred. Other computers will have dot one hundred one, dot one hundred two or three or four, or depending. And that will be dynamically assigned to all the computers which connect to the internet. And I'm using the default gateway IP to access my router. It is a router IP address, which I put into the interface of default gateway. And that's why I'm able to access it in the browser. So away from that, we are saying that users don't need to know how to configure IP addresses, right? You, when you're connecting to the Mobzi Wi-Fi, you don't need to know how to configure or how they were even configured. All you need to know is a username and password. You click on the Wi-Fi SSID, and then you punch in the password, and then you have connected. So as, as soon as they click connect to the network or connect via Ethernet cable, the server will automatically send address information to the device. And then you can you have noticed messages like acquiring IP address whenever you're connecting, right, for the first time. And then you tap on connect all wired devices. You see that it is identifying and then connecting or assigning IP address and that is what we call the dhcp server we together guys that is dynamic host configuration we together right any question as far as that is concerned so 
We now look at uh, some of the common application layer protocols, uh, which also include some of the other things which we are supposed to look at, like the file server, like the web server, mail server, and the DNS server. Okay. So the domain name system, um, and we are saying, imagine a world where we would type URLs as 192 dot 14 dot 80 dot 92 as opposed to the domain name like nm.com imagine whenever you need to access google right or whenever you need to access mobsip let me just bring my command prompt here right let me just go ahead and bring my command prompt here all right this is my command prompt and i'm saying imagine how do I increase font? How do I increase font? How do I increase font? Right, so I think that font is bigger now, right? Let me just relaunch it again. Okay, here we are, right? So let me go ahead and ping google.com so that I can get its uh, IP address. Okay, so I'm pinging google.com and it's on 172 dot. This is their IP or probably pub, pri public IP address. And I've gone ahead and copied it, right? So I've copied the IP address. And just imagine whenever I need to go ahead and visit, let me open a browser. Whenever I need to go ahead and visit uh, google.com, right? Uh, I need to go ahead and punch in this IP address. Do you think you'd remember? But it's not just google.com because when I punch in that IP address, it takes me to what? Google.com. Imagine if I also have to visit what? Mobsafe. So I go ahead and ping what? And whenever I want to visit Mubsep, I tell you go to Mubsep, you need to remember, oh, what's the IP address? The IP address is 34.76.3.244. So imagine whenever I need to come to Mubsep, I also have to go ahead and punch in what? The address of what? Of Mubsep. Actually, we did network address translation. That's why the firewall browser here is telling us it is not what? Available. So if someone had pinged and it was an attacker, and they are trying to access Mubsep using this IP address, public IP address. This is translated. They will not be able to access it because it has been uh, translated. So we are saying, imagine whenever you need to visit, you need to go ahead and remember those numbers. It would be hard memorizing such numbers for both even you IT people and even for non-IT users. Imagine someone who has never heard of even what an IP address is, a student of leisure and hospitality. And they're telling them, okay, you yeah, want to visit the student portal, go to 205.34.11. You can imagine the mess would be there, right? So network engineers sat down and thought of a solution. And this is the domain name system or what we call the DNS. What the DNS does, it resolves IP addresses in domain name and vice versa. That is going to help us translate the name of google.com from this weird, weird, weird numerical character, or for us, we know it because we are network engineers, there is an IP address. It's going to translate it to a name which we can easily remember as human beings. And we can easily remember google.what.com. 
But behind google.com, it's seated on a computer. It is hosted on a computer. I remember computers only understand and communicate using IP addresses. So for us to access it, we need to know the IP address. So the domain name system will help us to go ahead and resolve this IP address, which is hard to remember and translate it into a domain name which is easy for us to remember as human beings and even vice versa. So using the example above, we can ably type google.com, which will be translated and understood by the servers as one as that IP address we saw. So DNS runs on UDP port, which is what? Port 53, it is important you remember those ports. So you can, Go ahead, uh, your research is to read about the recursor, read about the root server, read about the TLD server and the authoritative name server. I'll go ahead and maybe just to talk about them briefly here, All right? And we are saying here that how the DNS works. Sorry, this thing's a little bit uh, crowded. So I think I did not edit very well. So, and I can't edit now, but we are saying that the domain, re, domain name resolution is performed um, I, I, identically, or is performed by a dedicated domain name system. The DNS involves the following types of servers. We have the root server, the top level domain server, recursive server, and the cut server. So what happens here, we have a client here, server who is accessing the internet for the first time, and let's say they would love to visit Huawei.com. And it goes to the internet and says, I'd love to visit Huawei.com. We have a catch server in between here. And the catch server, remember, you're visiting for the first time. It will tell you that, you know what? I do not know about this. I have to ask my experts. And what the catch server does for the very first time, it will go ahead and ask about server. Someone is having two devices or two people are close to each other and I'm getting echo, echoes. So Erot, please mute. Eh? Okay, so we have here what we call uh, the catch server, which is in between here and we have the root server. So the catch server will go ahead and ask the root server, hey, I have a client here, Bwambari wants to access Huawei.com. Their lecturer gave, him, gave them an assignment and it's on that platform. And because before we access, we need to know the IP address of this particular domain name. For us, Bambara has just typed in www.huawei.com or google.com or anything. Then the root server is going to be like, oh, okay. Uh, since you are asking about google.com, and the top level domains, because we know the top level domains, we have different domains, .com, dot, .academic, .org, .so many other top level domains. So it will tell the catch server that don't worry. Let me also go and ask the corresponding server, the top level domain server, which is storing these things and ask them. Of course, I want to go ahead and access google.com, but I want to know which particular recursive server or their server where their deep files are stored. I do not have that information, but I know I can access the recursive server to give me that information. The recursive server will check through its different details, and then it will know that, oh, .com, and specifically google.com, is stored on IP address, of z dot z dot z dot z. And therefore it will go ahead and respond to the catch server and tell it that I, I have found google.com on this server and it can be accessed by an IP address of z dot z dot what? Dot z. And then the catch server will be like, oh, thank you. But before it goes back and gives Wambari the feedback, it will also store this information in its catch information on its catch server. So that the other time Bwambar is accessing the internet, it will not have to go through all this process. Or if anyone else ever accesses google.com, like me or you or anyone, it doesn't have to go through the process because it has stored everything within the catch information. 
So Bambale will be told that, you know what, the address or the IP address of google.com is z.z.z. And therefore now, Bambale can establish a connection with google.com. Are we together? So the second time or any other time, Jovia wants to access google.com and he will punch into his browser that I want to go to google.com. The moment the cache server sees this domain, it knows that it has mapped it to this IP address. It will instantly give feedback to the host that google.com can be accessed via z.z.z. And therefore, we have, have, we have have completed what we call the domain name system. So you go ahead and read about the root server, top level domain server, recursive server, and the cache server very important concepts and interesting concepts. So web server, right? In order for us to have a global reach, for you to be able to reach out to my site, which I designed for you, right? A number of companies, organizations, and individuals like me have built websites. And these websites are hosted on computers called web servers. Your MOOPSEP, your student portal is hosted on a particular computer called a web server. So web servers use specific protocols like HTTP or HTTPS to send and receive requests from clients. And these are through HTTP request and response. So as you're browsing a given website, you ideally interacting with the server hosting such services. As you click for you, you don't know, you just click on this page, log in, do what, but ideally you are working with a web server, which is responding to your requests. Are we together? So this is how it works. You have a client, A, Jovia here, and she wants to go ahead to access the database somewhere or to put in requests or the application server, right? So she's going to go ahead and send in a request and then the web server will look and see if actually Jovia qualifies or she meets all the criteria to establish the connection. And then the, 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 the web server will go ahead and respond with the HTTP res response. In case there are other sovereign requests that are needed like accessing the application server or database, it will go ahead and initiate that request. And then also, the server will get a response and then on the response which is coming back to the user the web server has already taken care of such things if i will log into my uh, server here very briefly i can also as well as use an ip address or i can just go ahead and use uh, a domain name for easily accessing it but either way i'll just go ahead and punch in my details and then i'll be able so I have accessed my server, it is a server in itself. And this is just a server management software for my web server. And as you can see, I've logged in, it will tell you that the firewall is L to help you prevent people from attacking you. The backups are on to prevent, you know, sites of clients from, from uh, you know, maybe you get an attack and you can't recover from them the different emails available, the databases created, and the different disk space details, the memory usage of RAM, and ETC of the server. So it will tell you that it's running on Apache server, Vanish server, Nginx reverse proxy, FTP server, the ones you have been talking about, MySQL database server, uh, the DNS server, which is now going to be translating, and SHS server, and then the control tab for the daily tasks. So these are the different details. Please, if you are a hacker in this class, do not hack you. Shouldn't have provided these details, but yeah, that is it. So these are some of the details. And as you can see, the firewall is running very well and it would tell you that on such and such a date, someone was trying to use WordPress to attack from Russia and it was blocked. It will go ahead and tell you these are the things which have been happening. And as you can see, this is just today, right? It is just today and different people are trying to carry out different things accordingly. So that is the web server. And these particular files are stored on a particular server somewhere, right? And if someone wants to go ahead and access 
the different packages. If I go ahead and access, if I'm pulling these re records, these records are actually being now, my browser is establishing a connection between this browser here, which has all these relevant things from my web host here, which is actually storing all those files. So if I go to my file manager very briefly here, you will note that those files which you are accessing or which people are accessing are actually stored here, right? So I can go via to uh, home and then from home, I can access the different sites available. And then I can go ahead and access public.html. And these are now the files which people are accessing the files, the index and everything and etc that they're accessing for them to be able to access the different files available. So that is what we call a web server. So going forward, um, a web server can be static or dynamic. And a static web server is composed of a computer hardware and HTTP server software. And it is called so because the server sends its hosts files as it is to the computer that requests it for it. And a dynamic web server is composed of a computer hardware uh, HTTP server software, application server, and a database. It is dynamic because application server first updates the hosted files before sending the information to your web browser via the HTTP server. So that is what we call the uh, web server. So we have other things like the mail service. I am going through this very briefly because you know what they are and we have looked at some of them. But mail service, basically emails is one of the fundamental ways of communicating used by organization. Mail servers collect and distribute emails to their intended destinations. And uh, system administrators create email accounts for the users. And these email accounts are connected to the domain names iggy, uh, cloud.enam, uh, abdrt, mobs.se.ug, and for some of you who have communicated with me via email, you know that I use an email address of me at what? Send S. If I may open my Outlook very fast here. Okay. This is my Outlook very fast. I have one email address, which is info at mobs.se.what.ug, and it is working very well, this one here, and I am sending information to my clients. It is what? My email address and I'm receiving and all the emails that you have received whenever you have created accounts on my site are sent from these email addresses. And I use a email server for me to be able to achieve that. So sending and receiving of emails is governed by mail servers such as SMTP, POP3 and IMAP. So SMTP and POP3 and IMAP, uh, SMTP, which is simple mail transfer protocol. I know you did these protocols, right? and it handles outgoing emails. All emails that are coming from your computer are managed by the SMTP protocol. And POP3 and IMAP almost do the same things, but let me go through them so that you can see the difference. POP3 or what we call the post office protocol, a version three handles incoming emails and stores it on your local computer drive. And then the message will be deleted from the server. So if someone configures your client address with POP3, that means once you receive an email, it will then now be deleted from the server and it will only be stored on your local device. With IMAP, which is short for Internet Message Access Protocol, is also responsible for receiving emails, just like POP3. But IMAP stores the emails both on your email server and then synchronizes emails across multiple devices. So if you want to use uh, an, your email address on your phone, on your laptop, and any other device, the protocol which would be suitable for that would be IMAP. Now that's why when you're configuring Google or any other popular clients, you most of the time set it up using IMAP settings. And these messages are organized in folders like inbox, outbox, and etc. So, SMTP, POP3, and IMAP. So we use SMTP for what? Outgoing from your server, right? Are we together, guys? Outgoing. And uh, from outgoing, then we use uh, IMAP or POP3 to receive them. 
So we have a question here. What circumstances would system administrators choose POP3 over IMAP hint based on server storage space, synchronization, anywhere, anytime privacy, speed and ETC, right? So you can, you know, ponder about that in your free time. Excuse me, sir. Yes, please. <clears throat> Which one of those three eh, mm. is mostly used by organization or companies? By what? By organizations, top three, IMAP, and SMTP. Which one is mostly used by what? Organizations. It, that, that purely uh, depends on what they want to achieve. For example, if their messages are very confidential and they don't want them to be stored anywhere on the server, as long as the recipient receives it, it should be deleted from the server. Then that organization would you do which protocol? Pop three. Pop three, very good. But in such circumstances like moves, where I need to receive a communication, I maybe want to synchronize, receive it on my phone and any device anytime. Even when I lose my device, I should not be in position to say that I did not what? I did not um, uh, uh, follow up on, 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 on that particular email. And I want to receive it anytime, any day. Which protocol would I use? It would be IMAP. IMAP. Yeah. So you can go ahead and read about file and print services or the print server in your free time because we almost running out of time. Now, let us conclude with what? The address resolution protocol. Okay. We have seen that um, earlier for computers to receive, uh, they can receive uh, IP addresses dynamically assigned to them by the DHCP server, right? And we know very well that before this host A sends a packet to host C here, right? It needs to obtain the MAC address of host C and also the IP address of what? Of host C, right? It needs to know those things. It needs to know both the IP address and the MAC address, right? So we have these computers before they communicate, that has to be established. So how does it go, how is it going to know when it's communicating to this computer for the very first time, right? So firstly, we have what we call the ARP request and it is initiated by the host. So ARP request in its sense is broadcast. That's why the MAC address, the destination MAC address is denoted as FFF, which stands for broadcasts, meaning all these ones are ones, they're all on. It is what, what, what we call broadcasts. So we know that this is our source IP address for this computer of 10.0.0.1. And this is our MAC address for this computer. But we do not know the destination address for the computer we want to send to, right? And we want to find out what is the destination address for that particular computer. So what host A is going to do it is going to send what we call an ARP request and the ARP request is what we call in broadcast mode. So the packet is going to be sent from this computer to the switch or, and this switch is going to propagate since this packet is broadcast, it means what do we mean by broadcast? Send to all hosts on the network. So it's going to go ahead and it will send the packet to all computers on the network. B will receive, also C will receive. And what basically A is saying, I have this broadcast message. I want to send a message to Jovia, right? Jovia who is on 10.0.0.3 forward slash 24, but I don't know their physical address. I don't know where they stay and I would love to know. So I am sending this message with a destination IP address of Jovia's name, right? Logical address of 10.0.0.3. And my source IP address is here. I am Bwambare 10.0.0.1. And I do not know the MAC address. That's why it is what? Zeros. Or sometimes it can be denoted by ifs to know it's a broadcast uh, address. So the source is mine, which is the 0.48, right? Mm -hmm. This is my source address and the type is request. So this packet is going to go to host A, host C, and any other computer on the network. If there are 20, it would go to all those 
computers and is asking host B, hey, look here. I am looking for this particular person. Their logical address, IP address is 10.0.3, but I don't know their physical address. Could you be the one? This guy is going to look at his address and is like, no, 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 I am not Jovia. I am actually Rita, so please, this is a wrong address. And then this person will go ahead and discard this packet because it's not an intended recipient. Host D will also receive and say, you know what? I have this message I'm sending to Jovia, but his share address is 10.0.0, but I don't know her physical address. Could you be the one? And then host D will look at his address and it realizes that it is 200 or something, something, and will be like, no, 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 no. I'm actually, you are mistaken me for someone else. I'm not the one, so it will discard the packet and it will not receive it. Then once Jovia will go ahead and receive the packet, right? Because Jovia will have the same IP address, it will be like, oh, you want to actually talk to me? Jovia will be like, yes, I am the one, and I stay here at small gate. This is my physical address of 00.01.02.04.c3c. It is my physical address of what? Small gate. But before Jovia will go ahead and send what we call the ARP reply, she will also update her table. So at next time, she wants to go and visit Bwambare at Platinum. She knows that Bwambare stays at this what? Address of Platinum. So she will go ahead and update what we call her ARP table or the, the, the CAM table or the MAC address table. So she will go ahead and update hers as well and say that, okay, I know there's a friend here, right? Of 10.0.0.1, there's Bwambare here right? And Bwambari stays at what? This is his physical address, the MAC address of 0000, which is platinum. And he used the dynamic ARP, the address resolution protocol to get to me. So whenever I want to, whenever I need to communicate to him, I should always remember these details. So the switch will store that information and also host C will go ahead and store that information. And then host C will be able to respond to the packet. And this time round, remember the first request comes as a broadcast what? Packet, right? And the response now comes as unicast. Unicast means what? One. One. Because Jovi already knows how to respond to Bwambari. So she knows that the destination is what? It is 10 dot, sorry, the destination is zero. Dot zero dot one, and this is the physical address. So she will only send, she will not send to host. So host B will actually not even know that Jovia has responded to who? To host A. So Jovia will go ahead and send back the packet and respond to host A and tell it, oh, you are looking for me. You can actually find me here at small gate, Evelyn Hostel, room 33. And then Bambale will also go ahead and update his CAM table and know that whenever I need to go ahead and respond to, uh, to Jovia, that is my CAM table. So in the reply, as it is coming back to Bambale, Jovia will go ahead and update this information as a unicast packet. It knows the destination address is what? Platinum for Bambale, 04.4 here. I know also that the uh, Destination IP address, the name is what? 10.0.0.1, which is Bambale. And the source is has, and also the source mark address is what? Is, is, is has as well. So then it should go ahead and respond to that packet. And that way it has resolved the IP address and it knows that this address belongs to this physical address. And host A knows that whenever I need to communicate to host C, this address here belongs to this particular address and therefore a communication will be initiated. So we also have a very important concept as I'm winding up, which is called the gracious ARP. And the gracious ARP can be used to detect whether there's an IP conflict. I think that's what you should take away. What it does the first time, it is going to send a packet, a, a packet, but in this time, that destination address is a broadcast address and the source address, the source IP address is the same as its own IP address. And also the destination address, the destination and source are the same IP addresses, meaning it should be the only one to receive the packet. But if there's any other computer which goes ahead and receives this packet, then it will know 
that there is another person who has that IP address, mm -hmm. and therefore it will deny or decline this IP address and tell the DHCP server to go ahead and send it another IP address because this IP address is already in use by another computer. Lastly, IMCP used to transmit or control error and query messages, right? <laughs> IMCP is just basically the command I was using to see if google.com was on or available. This one here, ping, it has two of them. It has ping and it has trace root. Basically to test, right? Transmit call error and control messages. If the server is off as a network engineer, the first thing if they tell you Mopsep is not on or if uh, uh, my server is off, the first thing I need to do is to just come and what? And ping it. Once I get reply packets, I'll know that my server is on and the time to leave is that value and I have no packet loss, all right? So that is how it is applied. We have ping and we also have what we call trace root. You can read more about those things. Maybe we shall talk about some of those things later on when we meet. So finally, there's a quiz here and we are saying that which of the following is on the TCP IP model layer? That's a refresher question. We answer it very fast before we go to the next class. Session. Um, session. 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 Remember I told you to read about it. Did you forget about it? Same. It is what? B. It is B, very good. The answer here is B. All right, perfect. So thank you for this class. We shall uh, be in position to meet again. When, when else do we meet again? That will be Friday, right? Friday. It will be Friday. Okay, I will be in Kabale, uh, but I will. We shall have a session, right? Friday at ten, right? I will excuse myself and have a question, a, a session with you. I'll be traveling on Thursday to Kabale, but we shall have a session definitely. Uh, we shall be looking Friday at, at eight. Friday at eight. Eh? All right, yes. we shall be looking at um, Hello, sir. network management. Eh? Hello. Yes, please. Mr. Sandy. Yes, Marvin. Uh, could you please share the notes? Right away. Make sure immediately after this class.